Um, last week we did the introduction, of course. Today we are doing the Book of Job, um, one of the most important books in human literature. And I do not exaggerate that. Job has been as influential, perhaps, as any other book with regard to any ethical issue ever. And it's also considered a masterpiece of poetry. I'll talk about that. Um, next week, oh, I pushed the wrong button again. <laughs> I still haven't gotten used to this thing. Next week, no class. Next week is Holy Week. Sunday is Palm Sunday. Throughout the week is Holy Week. Um, and Thursday of next week is Monday Thursday which is the day that we celebrate the Last Supper. The reason it's called Monday, M-A-U-N-D-Y, is because during the Last Supper, the Lord gave the mandatum, is the Latin word, which means the commandment, the new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I've loved you. He, so that's part of the, that's why it's called Monday Thursday, because that's when God gave it, Jesus gave that new commandment. So, Monday Thursday, then Friday, we have, uh, and we have a service here at five o'clock, if you want to come to the community service, we also have a 5 o'clock Tenebrae service on, on Good Friday. Tenebrae is a service of darkness, very somber, very dark, the putting out of the lights as we recognize the suffering and death of Jesus. And then Easter morning we'll be here at 10 o'clock. Okay, not uh, somewhere. So that's next week, Holy Week. Um, then we will do two weeks, April 24th and May 1st, on the book of Psalms, which is pretty long, so we're going to break that up. Um, there's 150 of them, so we'll... I actually we could actually do five weeks because the book of Psalms is made up of five different books. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that. And then May 8th, we also have no class because Carolyn and I are going to be on a cruise ship. <laughs> um, one of our best friends from Seattle is having her 60th birthday. She's celebrating it by, by taking a five-day cruise from San Diego to Vancouver, British Columbia. And we're joining her for that because, again, she's one of our longtime friends. Uh, and she really wanted us to come, so we said we would. And then we come back for the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, and then the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon it's called, or the Canticle of Canticles, it's got several names, and then the final exam. I will make the effort, as I always promise, by the, the fifth week here, May 15th, to have what you need to know um, paper done so that you'll have something to study. Um, um, it's just going to tell you something else in there, too. Well, just remember, we're two weeks on, one week off, two weeks on, one week off, three weeks on. That's the way this seven-week uh, course is doing, okay? And seven weeks uh, worked out very well for this, given the number of books we have and, and other, other needs. Any questions about any of that? We're good? Okay, um, this chart I'm going to keep using because it gives you a very visual idea of the structure of the Old Testament. The five books of the law... The uh, books of history, as we call them in the English Bible, um, you have the five major prophets and the 12 minor prophets, and then what we're studying right now, the five books of wisdom. Now, not all of these books are historically known as books of wisdom, which is actually a genre. It's a literary genre that is very ancient. Um, and the Hebrews used it as well, but it goes back probably um, to 2000 BC or before. And uh, yet, for the sake of for instance, the Song of Songs is, for the most part, not really a wisdom book in terms of the genre of wisdom literature, but it doesn't fit anywhere else. Um, it's certainly not a historical book. It's not a prophetic book. It's, it's not one of the five books of the law. And so writings, you know, the, the Jewish Bible has a category called writings, where they put things in that don't clearly fit somewhere else. But um, the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon is put in with uh, the wisdom literature and psalms. Part of the psalms are wisdom writings. Part of them are not. But it is included in that group, okay? All right. Let's talk now about the book of Job. I mentioned to you that the book of Job has been called one of the great pieces of literature of the human race. Alfred Lord Tennyson called it the greatest poem of ancient and modern times. It is from its literary form uh, of wisdom literature, from its structure as a poem. It actually starts with a, a prose prologue, and then the majority of it is, is a poem. It's in a poetic form. In fact, in most Bibles, if you look at it, after the first, first section, the first prologue, it's written in like a poem. It's written in poetic lines. Um, and then you have a prose section as the, the close at the end. Uh, there are within it a number of different kind of sections that we're going to be talking about. What I'm actually going to do today for most of our time is walk you through the sections 
of the book of Job and talk about what they are and what they what function they perform and also look at some of the key verses from each of those different sections is how we're going to address that today. Um, and again, as always, if you have any questions, you know, let me know. The the so in terms of poetry, in terms of content, as as we said earlier, it's always been a problem in human existence. From the very earliest record we have of any human thought, the issue of understanding suffering, you know, where it comes from, why it exists, and how you deal with it, has always been a major theme in human thought, and human literary effort, and that's what this book is all about. It is probably the oldest or the second oldest book in the, um, the, the entire Bible. I say probably because it, it records a time that is as ancient as any other times. It, it, it records a time from the patriarchs. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. We'll talk about that. Whether it was actually written back then or was written later about that time, we don't know. We'll talk about it. Depends on who you think the author is. Um, that, that affects when you think it was probably written. But it addresses the theme of suffering um, as well as anything. Although, and this has always been a surprise to me, to be honest with you, it does not give, bless you, it does not give an answer to the question of why is there suffering that the world ought to accept. The answer it gives to suffering is God is in charge and we are not in a position to challenge him. And so we were forced to accept what he brings. And yet, even though that's not the answer that most of the world is willing to accept because they don't accept the authority of God or his right to do as he will because he is sovereign. You're right, you can't be a little bit sovereign. You either are or you aren't. Um, yet still, this book has managed to be uh, very satisfying, even soothing to people who struggle with suffering. Perhaps because the very fact that it takes suffering seriously. And it struggles with it. You know, it, it struggles with it a lot you know, for almost 50 chapters of struggling with it. And that within it, there are beautiful statements about the seeking after wisdom and any number of other things. So um, it has been extraordinarily influential. It is beautifully written, both the prose and poetry sections of it. And it has been universally recognized as being a great work of literature, as well as a very important piece of theodicy. Now, theodicy is the word, as, as we've said. Suffering is such an important issue, especially when you, for a person of faith, when you say that there is a God who is both all powerful and all loving, and yet there is suffering in the world. The issue to try to understand that and try to explain that is so important and has been so prevalent in human history that there's a special word for it. It's called a theodicy. T H E O D I C Y. Theodicy. A theodicy is an effort to understand and explain suffering in light of the existence of an all-loving and all-powerful God. Job is the supreme example of a theodicy, to try to understand the nature of suffering in the light of God. Okay? Now let's talk about some of the details behind this, um, this book, give you a little bit of the background, and then we can go from there. First, the author. We don't know. The book of Job does not identify its, its author. Um, in, in that regard, it is anonymous because it, it doesn't, in, within itself, it's not like the book of Romans, which says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the church in Rome. You know, it doesn't tell us that. So we don't know who the author is. Possible candidates for authorship are Job himself, and there's a question, was Job a historical character, or was he instead... Um, a character in this very important myth. Um, now, a myth, myth does not mean something bad. A myth can actually be true. A myth is any story that carries within it a much more important um, truth. So a myth is something that conveys a great truth that's important. Whether that myth is factual or non-factual doesn't matter. It can still be a myth. Um, and so, this, this is a great myth, whether it was true or not. Whether Job was a real person or not does not change the fact that there is great truth here to be conveyed to us. Okay? That doesn't affect, it, it could be something that someone was inspired by God to, to make up, but the content of it still is critically important for us in terms of its, its presence in the canon and the truth that it teaches us. So there may, if there was a person named Job, it may have been him. It may have been Elihu who is a kind of a mysterious character in here who is only presented late in the story 
you don't even know he's there, but he's apparently standing in the background, and then all of a sudden he speaks up and says, okay, you old guys are not doing a good job of this. I'm young, I know, but I got some things to say. And so we have the speeches of Elihu that come in there. Uh, some people believe that it might be Moses who wrote this, because it does, um, it is a story about the patriarchal period. And it's possible that Moses would have written this during the time of the desert when he also wrote Genesis, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, the traditional view that he wrote those books, which I believe is true, even though others may have been inspired to, to finish them out for him, like tell the story of his death and burial, um, Moses' death and burial. So it's, it's very possible. I read one scholar, you know, one account that said, well, it couldn't be Moses because there's a lot in the book of Job that there are uh, words and uh, customs that were unique to the Arabian Peninsula. And that Moses would not have known about those. And I'm going, what are you talking about? <laughs> Moses would have known about those. He'd be, if that's the case, he'd be ideal because of the many years he spent as a shepherd um, in that part of the world. So it could have been Moses. Some people have proposed that it was Solomon, partly because of the wisdom aspect of it. That uh, he might have, and to be quite honest, because of the, the somewhat, uh, there was a cynical edge to part of this book. And uh, Solomon late in his life, when he had really messed some stuff up, he became the master of cynicism. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, which we will study in a few weeks, is the perfect example of that. Um, that, that vanity, vanity, all is vanity. So some people have provoked, proposed Solomon. Some people have thought that it might even be post-exilic, that this, this story, which had existed for you know, generations, perhaps 2,000 years, that, uh, or 1,500 years, that sometime around the, the 500s, during the time of Ezra, that Ezra may have been the one who wrote this down. Now, we don't know. We simply don't know. But it doesn't change the fact that the content in this is critically important to us. Now, um, and again, stop me if you've got questions. Uh, the, the issue of author and dating are obviously linked because whoever wrote it, then it's when they were alive that it would have been written. Now, there's two, two kinds of dates. Whenever you talk about any scripture um, or, or anything that's got a context in terms of writing about a time period, there's two aspects of dating. One is the date of the events. When did this happen? Not when was it written down, that's not the first thing, but the first kind of date is when did it happen, the date of the events. And this is almost certainly written during the time of the patriarchs, which would have been sometime around 2000 to 1800 BC. Um, we say that for several reasons. One, the description of uh, the, all of the wealth was counted in terms of animals and flocks. The fact that uh, we're told that after all of this happened to him, when, he was, when, when Job was restored, he lived another 140 years. There are a number of other references here which are very ancient. There's no suggestion uh, in any of this, although Job is Jewish, you know, he is Hebrew. Uh, his whole conception of God that's presented is a very Hebrew kind of conception. Job um, gives no indication of <coughs> temple worship or the law, no reference to the, the Mosaic law or what it says. There's no reference in there from any character. There's also the fact that the sacrifice is made, and Job does it himself, which means that that would not have been permitted post-Mosaic law, which means it would indicate that the events happened sometime before the 1500s, okay, or the, the, the 1450 to 1500, which is the period of time of the law and the Exodus and all that. Um, and so the indication is this was written in a patriarchal time. When I say that he lived to be 140 years, that was the record in Scripture is that that's the kind of age people you know, lived to back in the patriarchal times, not later. And so there are quite a few different pieces of this that indicate to us that this story goes back, the events of the story go back to a patriarchal time period, 1800 to 2000 BC. Does that make sense? Now, as to the writing, it entirely, the date of the writing, it entirely depends upon who you think wrote it. If you think it was Moses, then it was written sometime 1450 to 1500, somewhere in there. So it would have been written 500 years or so after the events. And that legend, you know, the story of Job would have been carried down. Uh, by the way, I mentioned earlier, you're under author, one of the candidates is the Job himself. One of the things that indicates to us that it might actually be a historical event, and that Job was a real person, is that the name Job is... is there's several other references to that name in ancient Near Eastern literature. 
So it really was a person's name. And there's even sort of a semi-hero kind of person during the time of Daniel that they refer to, um, you know, a, a, they refer to somebody in the past as being uh, Job, who was a, a, a hero. We don't know anything else about it, but it's possible that that's a similar reference and that Job really was a, a real person because the name rings true, okay? So, um, it, some people believe that, and I didn't even put Ezra up there, but if, if Solomon wrote this, then it would have been the 950 date. So, it's like Moses, the 1450 date, Solomon, the 950 date, the two ranges. If it's true that this had been passed down all the way to the time of Ezra, like Ezra and Nehemiah, then that would be all the way down into the 500s. So, um, we don't know for sure. And it's, it's not, again, none of these things are problematic to us in terms of the, the reliability of this as scripture. Because it doesn't make a claim. If it said, I, Job, a servant of God, am writing this, then that would change everything. Just the same way when, when liberal scholars say that we don't think that, that Paul wrote um, 2 Thessalonians or Peter didn't write 2 Peter or John didn't write 2 or John, the books that actually say, here's who's writing it, if we say we don't believe that's true, then the veracity of the whole book goes out the window. That's not true with a book like Job. We can ask that question and say, we don't know who wrote it. It doesn't change the reliability or the truthfulness of the book, right? Any questions about that? In terms of the recipients, we believe the initial recipients were ancient Jews, ancient being somewhere in that, you know, 950 to, to 1450 probably, probable range, but everyone since. As I say, this book has been so influential in all time since then that it's, um, it's been a very significant analysis of human existence that has affected people ever since and still does today. I mean, obviously, even though you may not have understood parts of it or even particularly agreed with parts of it, it affects people. Even today, it affects people if they, if they take the time to read it. Um, and granted, Joe, being a very ancient writing, it's not as easy for us sometimes to follow it all. And it takes some effort, but if you do, it is very, very rewarding, okay? So, what are the themes that are conveyed in Job? First, oh yes, join. I, I'm a little confused. Um, it's during the time of the patriarchs. Was, was that not before there was actually a Jewish? People? The Jewish people started with Abraham, who was the first patriarch. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob um, would have been are, are the patriarchs. And so any time in that period would have been when apparently the Job event happened. And so if it was written back then, then it, it would have been for, for the most ancient of peoples. But if, if we take the date 1450, which was the time of Moses, it's still, those are still considered the ancient Jewish people. That's before they had, you know, they had taken over the land of Israel, you know, before they moved to the Promised Land and all of that. So anywhere between the time of Abraham and the time of Moses would have been considered an ancient Jewish period. And the, that's for the period of the writing, in terms of, and the period of the writing is what affects who it was written to. Right. You know, not, not when the events happened, but we think the events probably happened sometime during the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob period, which would, would have been 2,800. Okay, so other peoples would have identified them as Jews. From the time of Abraham. I mean, at first, they would have, the, the, the name Jew didn't come until after the, after the Babylonian exile. Because after the, the Babylonian exile, you know, the northern kingdom of Israel had been destroyed. The southern kingdom was called Judea. And from Judea, they started calling the people who returned to that part, to Jerusalem in the southern part of Palestine, which was called Judea. They started calling them Judas, or Jews. Okay? Um, and that word Judah, in some form, is in Spanish, Juden, in German, etc. So the, the very word Jew comes from Judea, much later. But we still use it generically to refer to all of the people who were descendants of Abraham, the Hebrew people. So but how did others refer to the patriarchs and that before the word Jew, just people of God? They would call them the people of Abraham. In fact, all the way, all the way, you know, people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, depending on where you were. Okay. In the same way that they referred to God as, as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. So they used the, the patriarchs, they used their names as sort of the reference points for them until, and then at a certain point they started being called the Hebrew people and then later on the Jews after the Babylonian exile. Okay? 
but there was a clear identity for those people, whatever the particular name was. When I say the ancient Jews, I'm just using the common parlance today, even though they weren't called Jews back in the time of Abraham. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what are the major themes? One of the obvious themes, and, and the primary ones, is why do the righteous suffer? Because Job's claim all the way through here, the whole dialogue, and we'll look at some of those verses in a few minutes, was, I haven't done anything to deserve this. Why is this happening to me? Now, God. Now, he particularly is addressing that to God, but he's doing it because he's got three supposed friends who are there kicking him while he's down, saying it's all your own fault. You know, let's, let's blame the victim. Okay? Um, and that's what that's all about. So why do the righteous suffer? But in addition, it, it's bigger than that. Why is there suffering at all? Because you have, um, you know, the, the first three of his friends, who are the primary talkers, um, they're saying it's because you're a sinner. God punishes sinners, so you must have done something terribly wrong. And, and Job keeps saying, no, I didn't. Then you have Elihu comes along and says, well, no, you guys don't know what you're talking about, and you're not doing a very good job of presenting this, and, and, and Job, you're, you're not being humble about this anyway. Perhaps God is using this to perfect you in some way, to make you better. Maybe it's not because you did something wrong, although you probably did. You know, life is not completely clean on this. But he does say perhaps God is using this to purify you, make you better, whatever. Uh, and so there is this issue of why is there suffering at all? What causes it? Why does it exist? But then we get into the issues of um, the fact that God is in control and we are not. God's two speeches out of the whirlwind are very powerful and beautiful statements about that because it goes through a long litany from the creation down through the maintenance, the providence of God in all creation, saying, can you do this? If you can do this, then you have a right to challenge me. But if you can't do any of this, then do you really think you have a right to question me and what I either do or allow? Um, so the point that God is in control, that we are not, that it's not right for us to try to give God's orders or call him to account. Justify yourself. Explain to me what right you have, God, to do these things. And God says, you really want to go there? The idea that God is good and that his motives are right and pure, even if we do not always understand them, even if we experience them as grief and pain, God has demonstrated his goodness and that his motives are right. The story which I use often of Martin Luther before he became the reformer Martin Luther, he was a monk. He was an Augustinian monk. He was a he was a the strictest possible monk in the strictest available monastic order. And he worked and worked and worked and worked constantly. And he himself testified later he was constantly in fear of his own salvation. Because he never thought he had done enough. There's always something else. He still had bad thoughts. He didn't do a perfect job, whatever it was he was doing. And finally one day. I think by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I think Luther would say that too. Luther said to himself, you know, God is God. He is always right. He is always just. If he decides to send me to hell, then that must be the right thing to do. And that's not for me to question. The point here is that when Luther, Luther says that the, the minute he acknowledged that, he never again feared for salvation. That his fear was a product of his lack of faith. And when he finally allowed his faith, even to say something that seems absurd to us, like if God sends me to hell, that must be the right thing to do, then he was okay. And so that's part of the message here, that um, even if we don't understand God's motives or his actions, those motives and actions are pure and they're right, because he is God. He is the definition of what is pure and right. And so everything that proceeds from him is the right thing, even though we don't see far enough or clearly enough or have enough wisdom to always understand how that is true. So, we have to have faith in God no matter our circumstances because He is in charge. Joanne. Well, early in my walk of, of my Christian faith, I was taught also that there is suffering because of Adam and Eve's sin, that the world is sinful. Is that a piece of that? Or well, the world, the world is broken. Okay, but there is sin in the world, and there are things that happen. I mean, animals kill other animals, and animals kill people because of sin bringing death into the world and destruction. That's why when, at the final day, the final consummation, the lion will lie down with the lamb because there will no longer be 
the need for death to occur in order for animals to be sustained. And there wasn't previously. The first gift that God gave to Adam and Eve was skins of animals to cover themselves with, to cover their shame. Which means that one of the results of Adam and Eve's sin was that death came into the world for the first time. Okay, because neither animals or anything else, you know, death didn't occur for any being prior to the sin of Adam and Eve. So it is true that the world is broken, but you need to go back and listen to the lecture on God's providence. We cannot, it's very common these days, to make the mistake uh, of falling into a deistic view of the world. Deist deism, which by, as, as a religious view, doesn't really exist anymore in any consequence. I mean, there are people, no doubt, who still hold to it. People think crazy things. You know, people worship their toasters. I don't know. But deism is the belief that God... <clears throat> Whether he was a personal God to start with or just an evolutionary force, not a personality. That the creator made the world, and when he made the world, he created certain natural laws. And then he left. Or at very best, all he does is make sure the natural laws stay in place. And that whatever happens as a result of those natural laws just happens. Stuff happens, as I said last week in the lecture. That is not a Christian perspective. That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says God is actively involved in His creation. And last week, for those of you who were in that class, I gave like 150 verses, and I could have given 250 more, which talk about God actively being involved in everything that happens, even the things that we perceive as evil. Okay? Um, and, and, but so many people today, including Christians, think, well... Things just happen. The world is a fallen place and things just, just happen and it's not God's fault. Well, God is actively involved in everything that happens. It's the orthodox Christian view of the providence of God. When it says that not a sparrow falls, you know, that, that God isn't aware of it and, and even involved in it, that God knows the number of the hairs on your head, which I acknowledge is easier for some of us than others, <laughs> that you know, nothing happens, that God is not there actively involved. So we need to make sure that we don't ever fall into this, and this is a common view in the world today, that Christians also fall to, is that God just started it and set up the natural laws and everything else just sort of happens. Stuff happens. No, not according to the Christian view. God is involved in everything that happens. That is what providence means. Providence is that the belief that God is not only created the world, but that providence says he is actively involved in maintaining it, in, in preserving it, and governing it and moving it forward toward his ultimate will. Okay? Now it is the world is fallen, and bad things happen because the world is fallen, but we can't make the mistake of thinking that's because God isn't there to do anything about it. Okay? Yes? So um, I'm not reading all these books, historicals. We, we realize that uh, God is in control, as you say, mm -hmm. in everything. So uh, then the fact of the way that we pray, uh, well, I think I, I I assume that we're wrong because if he's in control of my life, how do I ask him? So you know, you know. Now I said, well, you know everything about me. I don't even know what you have prepared for me <laughs> yes. because if you know everything and I don't know anything, so just help me to get over it. Yeah. The plan that you have for me because uh, now it, it's. For example, now that they send us a, a big mail in order to ask for people that we see who is who is in trouble, right. it says, "Well, uh, and when I read that, it says, you have this is your control. You know what is happening in every family, mm -hmm. so I don't have to control. You have that control, right? So do do I have the right to ask for them because he is in control, so right. I don't have to ask anything." But, see, the danger, there's a mystery here, okay? Mm -hmm. The danger that we cannot fall into is the, is the attitude of fatalism, which is, which is the attitude of Islam. Aksala, if God wills it. When I was with World Vision, for instance, uh, working in West Africa, they were having an outbreak of a number of different kinds of diseases for which there were inoculations. Well, the imams, the local Muslim clerics, really were the controlling force in most of the small villages. And we would go in and say, we want to immunize the children. They would say, no. If a child gets a disease and dies, that's God's will. And you don't have anything, you can't try to do anything about that. And it was very hard for us to find imams, especially imams with enough influence to make a difference with other imams, 
that would allow us to do that kind of work. Now, that is not the Christian view. Scripture tells us to come before the throne of grace and present our needs and our requests. The mystery is we don't understand how it is that a God who is sovereign, who is providentially in control of everything, how or even why it is that he allows us to participate with him in the working out of his will. But he does. And he tells us to pray. Uh, again, in the terms of providence, the God is called the first cause or the prime mover. God started everything. In terms of his creation, he's responsible for creating everything. We didn't have anything to do with that. But in a mysterious way, Scripture tells us that God, in his providence, in the working out of his will, which includes suffering and prayer for needs and all of that, that God allows the second causes, which is us. He made us, but then we are responsible for other things. Okay? A second cause is also that in the book of Genesis, it said God created you know, the plants of the field that reproduced in their kind. In other words, God created them so that they then could have you know, product following that without God having to say, you know, every plan. He created it so that that would be the case. Well, he created us as second causes as well, that we, participating with God, that we have the opportunity to be active and do things as well. We can do good, we can do ill, we can do evil. But the mystery is how and even why God allows us to ask for his, for his, you know, for him to change. Now, the right kind of prayer is not to assume we have a right to demand anything. There's, there's different words for prayer in the New Testament. The, the most important one, prosukomai is the Greek word, means to invite God to participate with us, to join with God in something. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed, Lord, if it be your will, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Okay? So he asked for what he wanted, but he, Jesus, the perfect example for us, said, if this is in your will. He qualified it to say, I am not trying to ask for anything that is outside your desire or your providence or your will. But I can still ask. And we have examples. I mean, the issues of, you know, you, Mike, you mentioned the negotiation. Well, if there's even 10 people who are righteous in this town, would you not preserve it, not destroy it? God lets us come to him with those things. Now, how, that's, how that works with a God who both knows everything and is all-powerful, there is a mystery there, and we widely recognize it. An another example, parallel to the prayer thing, is giving, stewardship. Some people seem to have the idea that God is sitting on his throne in heaven, wringing his hands, saying, boy, I sure hope those people at Lakeside Presbyterian give enough money this week, or my will is not going to go forward in the world. Obviously not. And yet, God tells us to give. He tells us that we can join with him in, a very, in very practical ways, in prayer, but also in giving, in order to cause his good and loving will to go forward in the world. Why, and, and the best answer for why he does that is because he wants to bless us. He wants us to have the joy and the satisfaction of be, working in concert with God to have his will done. His will will be done one way or the other, but he allows us to join with him, and he listens to us. He's not forced to do what we ask, but he does listen to us. And so there's a mystery there, but we can never fall into the failure of fatalism, thinking, well, it's going to happen anyway. God's God. He's going to do what he wants. I don't have anything to do with it. Because, because in his generosity, he has allowed us more than that. Okay, Mike first, and then... And then my, kind of, my understanding of a prayer, a lot of prayer, is that God has us pray for things that he wants to get in, and if he want, if it's in his will, he'll give us, in order not to violate our, our free will. Mm -hmm. In other words, he doesn't say, okay, uh, Black, will you pray for, to become the CEO of AT&T, and, and, uh, and, and I'm going to do that as, as uh, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, if he just did, just dumped it on you, then he'd be violating your, your, your free will, and, and you'd be nothing but an automaton. You, know, you wouldn't have a choice. You know? Yeah, you wouldn't have a choice. Yeah. Well, you look at James and it says, The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Right. So evidently our prayers accomplish something. And then you look back at the book of Esther when Mordecai told Esther about when she was getting, you know, questioning, you know, should I go before the king or not? And Mordecai says, you know, you've, if, you, if you don't go before the king, 
you know, salvation will come from some other God will do it some other God way. God will do it some other way. Yeah. You, you may have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Right. And he so, says that and if you don't, then... Yes, don't expect to live. Yeah, you, you will not be part of God's plan. Um, and, and there's an aspect in which there's blessing if you are part of God's plan. And so all of that is true. There is still a mystery there in terms of how God invites us to do that. But he does. We have that grace. We have that benevolence. That God, who is the God of the whole universe, who does not need us. God does not need human beings for any reason. But he creates us, and then he invites us to be in relationship with him, and he invites us to participate with him in the working out of his providential will in the world. And again, of the, of the words for, uh, for prayer, the, the worst one is to demand something. And then there's the, well, to ask respectfully. And then there's the, the you know, kind of humble. <laughs> but the most important word, and actually the one that's used most often in the New Testament, in, the, in, the, in Jesus especially, is prosukomai, which means to invite God's participation with us. Or you could even say to acknowledge that God has invited us to participate with him. And to say, for instance, when the, when the, the boy victimized by the, the evil spirit, the father brings him and says that, you know, this evil spirit keeps throwing my son into the water and the fire trying to kill him. And your, your apostles prayed for him and nothing happened. And Jesus said, well, this kind will only come out with much prayer. And, and the word there is prosupomai. In other words, with involving God intimately in causing this to happen. And it appears as though the, the, in that story, and the apostles say, why couldn't I, you know, why couldn't we do it? And, and Jesus says, you have to have prosukumai. You have to have God involved. You have to invite his participation. Or, again, the word, you know, it's the two halves of it. The word could equally say, you have to be willing to participate with God in this, not just to ask him for what you want. And that's why real prayer isn't just telling God your, you know, what you want. It isn't presenting your wants to God. It isn't your list. If there is not a relational aspect of that, you know, that you're not giving adoration to God and confession and thanksgiving and all the other pieces. Before you get to supplication, before you get into asking, then by definition, that kind of prayer is not the right kind of prayer. That's not what real prayer is. And that's why the prayer of a righteous man, one who is in fellowship with God, availeth much, because they have the right balance of relationship with God to have that prayer be useful. We've got way off on other stuff, but it's, it all comes back to the understanding in terms of suffering. Um, let's take a break. Let's, let's now get into the actual content of Job. I want to go through each of the sections and, as I say, give you some, some scripture verses that relate to it. The first section, the prologue, occurs in two scenes. First, we have the introduction of Job on earth as being a great man of the East. Uh, he is wealthy. He is respected. He's got everything going for him. He's got uh, huge flocks, which is what wealth was measured in. His children are um, grown. They are, so, are well off, well to do. They party a lot. And uh, Job presents sacrifice for them to make sure that they're not sitting inadvertently kind of thing. Um, and so I want to give you a number of verses. This first, the prologue, which is a prose prologue. It starts it on earth, and then it goes to heaven. And in heaven, we have um, the presentation of God and the heavenly host, the angels, are gathered, and the devil shows up. We have an image of the devil being able to come before the courts of God, and God says to the devil, where have you been? And the devil says, roaming to and fro on the earth. And God says, well, what do you think about my servant Job, who was a, a righteous and good man? And the devil says, well, sure, he's righteous and good. You give him everything. You know, if you, if you didn't give him everything, he would not be so good to you. And so God gives permission to the devil to take away anything that uh, Job has, to take away his wealth. And again, the devil is trying to get Job to fail, to deny God, which, which is a tempting. The Lord, who knows Job and knows Job's heart and knows Job, what Job's response is going to be, is testing Job, but not to get him to fail, but rather to get him to succeed. And then the devil takes away everything from Job, and then Job um, still doesn't deny God. And the devil says, the devil arrives before, uh, Satan arrives before God again, and 
say, and God says, well, what do you think about Job? It didn't work. See, he still is, he hasn't said anything wrong still. And the devil says yes, because he still has his health. And, then, and God says, you can, you can smite him, but you can't kill him. And so the devil causes him to have disease, boils. And there's this horrible scene of him sitting outside on an ash heap, scraping the boils with a piece of uh, pottery. And uh, still he does not deny God. So this is the setup for the whole thing. Some of the verses, Job 1, 1 to 3. In the land of Uz, and we believe this was northeast of Palestine, the area that had been toward Mesopotamia, uh, probably Syria or um, you know, that area up toward the Euphrates. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He was the greatest man among all the peoples of the East. So we are presented the image of Job, and it gives a description there as well of his wealth and that sort of thing. Um, once all the things were taken away from him by the devil, Job says, Naked I came from the mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. You've heard that. Um, sometimes they quote that in funerals, which is really an inappropriate use of that verse. Okay, you need to have some appreciation of the context before you use Bible verses for things like that. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And so, it continues. The devil has taken everything away. He reappears in heaven. And we have Job 2.3. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? This is the second time he says that. Okay, This is after Job has already had everything taken away and has not yet charged God with wrongdoing. has not yet done wrong. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. And so then the devil is given permission to go back and, and give him an illness, to take away his health, not to kill him, but to take away his health. And when he is completely broke, he's lost everything, he's, he's ill now, and um, the, sitting on the ash heap kind of thing, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. And he replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble that actually, early on in the process, that establishes, I think, the right tenor. You know, we accept, nobody ever questions that God is God and that he knows what he's doing when we get the good stuff. And yet, when it doesn't go our way, in any way, we say, oh, God doesn't know what he's doing, or, you know, God, God's mean, or whatever. And Job, in his wisdom, said, all right, it's a package deal. If we accept good from God, we must also be prepared to accept trouble. And there is great wisdom in that. Okay. So this is the prologue. Questions about that? This is the prose part. We then, the next section we come to is a monologue by Job, in which he, in chap, the chap, uh, all of chapter 3, he goes along and he, he is, it's a monologue of mourning. He's recognizing <laughs> how much he had and how much he's lost and he is now sick and broken and he is sort of rehearsing all this and saying why has this happened to me and Job 3 the first two verses after this Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth he doesn't curse God but he says better I would never have been born and he, he talks about all of the wonderful things he's had and you know how it's so human to want to want to go back to the good times but this is where he is now. Bob? To back up for just a second, <clears throat> it's always possible to be recorded a conversation between God and Satan. <laughs> uh, well, we, if we believe that God inspired this, then God could have communicated directly to whoever wrote this down. If we believe this is the Word of God and God inspired it in the writers, then God would have been the one that communicated that. Or whether he communicated in terms of, okay, here what I, here's what I said, then here's what the devil said, and here's what I said. The point of communicating that, well, God didn't do it. God did not, did not do the destruction to Job. He didn't kill his family or kill his flocks. God gave permission for the devil to. Uh, that's another thing people often miss. It isn't, uh, even though Job, Job doesn't have any concept of the devil, he thinks the Lord must have done it. And yet we're told the devil did it. 
the, the truth that God inspired in the writer of this, he also gave them either the direct inspiration or the wisdom to create it in a way that gives us truths about the devil and about God. So, again, whether it was verbatim kind of dictated to whoever wrote it down, or whether God gave the wisdom to the person who wrote it down to help them set it up in such a way that it gives us an understanding of the devil and of God and of how God works. Either way, God inspired it. Yes? Sometimes, for example, when you read that first he, he finished his, um, his family was oh, several things he lost at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think that he, that he doesn't even uh, thought it. He, he didn't have time to re, re, to process it. Yes. So, and for example, when someone lost a very important people, it takes time to get over it. So by the time he did, took over it, uh, he had he had sores and some things. So that's why he did say, hey, "What's the matter with me? What is happening?" Mm -hmm. By the time he had the most important lost. He didn't realize about what he, what was happening. I think so because why didn't he say why is happening that to me? Well, but he does in chapter three. I mean, when he's talking about this, he he begins to say, uh, I, "Better I die." I don't know why this is all happening to me. You know what is going on? And it's here where he begins to say, "Why has God done this to me?" Mm -hmm. Okay, because again, he doesn't have a concept of of the devil. But he, the, the most part of chapter 3 is simply remembering all that he had and feeling like, better I die, you know. Um, but he's not going to kill himself. So, Marvin? Either chapter 7 or 9, it talks about he's sitting on that ash heap for months. Yeah. Uh, so he had time to think. Yeah. <laughs> and his friends came and sat for a week, and he had time to think. And during this time, he's going, I, this is no way to live. Right. Well, and he goes from, you know, in... in Chapter two, where he says, "Shall we thank? Shall we, you know, uh, thank God for good and not for trouble?" Yes. His attitude gets more skeptical and more negative as he goes along, particularly because of his wonderful friends, you know, yeah. blaming don't, him. Don't forget his wife. Well, his oh, wife. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and so, and so he does. I think there's a process where he gets sort of darker and darker about this until God finally speaks directly to him. Yes. Yeah. In defense of his wife, she lost everything too. Yeah, they were her kids too. So you, you know, people just want to really quick to jump on her and you know. Well, but she didn't say, "I'm going to curse God." Right? You want to come with me? <laughs> she just says it to him. Yeah. Why don't you curse God? And die? She's not volunteering. Yeah, I'll see what happens to you first. Yeah. <laughs> well, then after that uh, chapter three monologue, we then have the longest part of the book which is a series of three cycles of dialogue between Job and his friends. And here again, we're in the poetic uh, section of the book. This is from chapter 4 to 27. Um, three of Job's friends arrive. You know, I use friends with quotation marks around them. Elithaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite. They are his three friends who come. Now, we don't. at this point, we're not introduced to Elihu, who comes, who comes later. I'll mention him when we get to his speeches. But all three of them basically say the same thing. And that is, boy, this is terrible that happened to you, but you must be a terrible person for it to have happened. They blame him. And this is um, uh, Eliphaz, the Timonite, says, Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where, um, where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God they perish, for the blast of his anger they are no more. So they basically set up the whole thing, and all three of them agree, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, that all these horrible things that have happened to you must be your own fault. You must be a terrible person. Now, this idea of... of a moral retribution kind of approach was quite common in the Old Testament. The idea, up until the time of Jesus, throughout all of the Hebrew uh, time, based upon the fact that quite often in the Old Testament, when, when the Israelites would sin against God, God would punish them. They developed this idea, this moral retribution idea, that whenever you do something wrong, God will punish you. And therefore, if God is punishing you, you must have done something wrong. See, they turned it around in a way that is not consistent with Scripture. This was a common belief. 
By the time of Jesus, you had, if somebody had leprosy, then they must have done something wrong. Uh, you'll remember when the, the man born blind was there, the, the uh, disciples asked Jesus, was it because of this man's sin or his parents' sin that he was born blind? And the idea is he's born blind. He, you know, he couldn't have done very much wrong before that. So was it his parents' fault? Anything negative, a woman who did not have children must have offended God in some way. And so this was a very common kind of idea that if something has gone wrong for you, you must have offended God and he is punishing you for that. Kind of. This was very prevalent in the 70s and 80s with the name it and claim it, the movement where if you were, you know, if you were he not healed when you either didn't have faith or you still had sin in your life, Johnny Erickson faced all of that. You know, when she, after she broke her neck, she tells that in her book a step further of how it was a faith-destroying uh, process that she went through until she finally had to reject that whole model. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, people still do that today. Even yes. people who aren't of faith, they go, well, these terrible things are happening. I must have done something wrong. That is not scriptural. <coughs> yes? Well, King David's wife was left barren because she did not. Well, and his son died because of their sin. Now, that doesn't mean... Now understand what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that if you have if you have done something wrong that God may not either actively punish you or um, you may have to sleep in the bed that you made. In other words, when, when we sin, if we repent of that sin and confess to God, He will forgive us of that sin, but it may be that there are consequences you still have to deal with as a result of that, as David did. God forgave David. But David still had all kinds of problems that were a direct result. Of his own actions, right? Someone who um, you know who commits adultery, they recognize their sin, they stop the adultery, they confess before God, God forgives them, and they can be reconciled to God. But you know, sexually transmitted disease and unwanted pregnancies and things like that still may happen, and we may have to deal with the fallout of our own sin. There are times, Scripture tells us, when God does punish people much more proactively than that. <clears throat> but that's not the same thing as saying everything bad that happens must be because we've done something against God. And that's what uh, Job's friends were saying, and that's what many of the Jewish people all the way up until the time of Jesus said. And when they asked Jesus that question, you know, would this man born blind, did he sin or did his parents sin? God said it's not, and Jesus said it's not because of the sin that this has happened, but rather it's happened so that God can prove his glory in this man. Right? How much harder... It had to have been for them. They didn't have the written word. They didn't have the Bible. So it's almost easier to understand how they would think the consequence of the sin. They, they don't have a book to refer to to go back right. and say, you know, okay, I need to realize this. I don't understand. Yeah, that's true. I mean, depending upon when you think it was written. If it was yeah. written later, then they would have had the Old Testament, uh, or much of the Old Testament. You know, by Solomon's time, they had certainly the law, and so they would have had record of that. But, um, but yeah, it's true. They don't have, they did not have the same sense. But they turned around. The fact that sometimes when we, when we sin against God, we are punished or we suffer this, the consequences of our sin, at least, they perceive that the other way. That when something bad has happened to you, it must be your fault. That God is punishing you always. And that's not always the case. It was not the case here. That's one of the reasons this book is so important, is it tells us, Every bad thing that happens in our life is not because God is mad at us. And that's very important for us to remember. Okay? Uh, so this is the uh, Eliphaz saying this. We then get Job 5. For hardship does not spring from the soil, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. Yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. Again, they're blaming Job. They're saying, you know... You did this awful stuff, and there are consequences to it. Job then comes back, and I'm going to give you several verses from Job, where he says, in, like in Job 10, I say to God, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands, while you smile on the plans of the wicked? Again, this idea that I've not done anything wrong. I've been righteous before you. I don't deserve this. Are you doing this for some reason? I don't understand, because... I see wicked people, and you're blessing them. Remember the, you know, the rain falls on the righteous and unrighteous, we read in the New Testament. That it's not a bad people get bad things, good people get good things. 
That's, it's not as simple as that. And yet we always want to try to boil it down to that. From the very, you know, from the very earliest of times to even today. Continuing with the dialogue cycles, these are all evidence, uh, all references that Job makes to his own innocence. He says to his friends, what you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. You're not telling me something I don't know, in other words. But I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. You, however, smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. Thanks, friends. Job 13, though he slay me, yet while I hope in him, I will surely defend my ways to his face. Some of these verses, passages, at least parts of them, you will recognize because of the influence that the book of Job has had. And then Job 27, as surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty who has made my life bitter, as long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not say anything wicked, and my tongue will not utter lies. I will never admit you are in the right. He's talking to his friends there. Till I die, I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my innocence and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. He will not accept the fact that he has done something wrong, no matter how much his, his three supposed friends try to tell him it's his fault. Okay? It is not the victim's fault, always. It can be, but it's not always. And we, need to, we need to understand that. Okay? The next section, starting with chapter 28, is a section of three monologues. Um, three very different pieces that kind of drop into the room. <coughs> the first of them is a poem to wisdom. Remember, this is wisdom literature. All of Job is a uh, wisdom literature in the sense that it deals with struggles in life to help us understand them in the light of God's uh, existence, God's presence. Now, the poem to wisdom in chapter 28 questions whether or not wisdom is available to human beings. And the start early in chapter 28 says, but where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. This starts out talking about mines. People go into mines and they dig out gold and silver and that there is great riches to be available, but there are some things you can't find in a mine, like wisdom. You know, it is not, um, it can't be found in the land of the living. You can't go and seek it out in the geographical world. Okay? And Later on, Job 28, where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is a quote from the book of Proverbs. It's right here as well. This is a, this, the fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom is a major theme throughout all of the, the biblical wisdom literature. Okay? So after we have the poem to wisdom, the second of the monologues is Jacob's closing monologue, chapters 29 to 31 in which he sort of sums up where he is on all this after his, his disagreements with uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Yes? Can I just ask, would you put the knowledge of God, uh, if you go back, you, it was the, the fear of God, right. would it be the knowledge of the Lord that is wisdom? Could you... Could well, people, are, people always want to jump and get away from the word fear. Okay. And I've heard heard people excuses and go, well, it means awe, it means respect, it means reverence. It means all of those things. And it also means the knowledge of God, but it also means fear. And we're, we're so wimpy, we don't want to accept that. If I have a conception of God who is truly God, who made me, who has the power to snuff me out, who has the power, as Martin Luther said, to send me to hell and be right about it if he chooses to, I better have a respectful fear. Now, not, not a fear that makes me, um, that, that makes me hate him or, or not want to approach him. Or It's not that kind of fear. But it is, it, it's, it's simply the acknowledgement, fear which says, I know that God could, you know, I could be gone in a heartbeat. I could never have existed if he wishes. If I don't have 
a kind of awe that, that is the recognition that my destruction is with the potential, you know, that God has that capability, then I've lost it. And, and yet, every time I know that we use scriptures that say the fear of the Lord, people want to try to soften that. And I think that it means all those other things. But it also means recognizing He is God. He is all-powerful. He is not like me. I can't fully understand Him. And that should make me a little scared. Not to be fearful, but to recognize the power of God in such a way that, you know, He is more dangerous to me than any lion ever could be, or any, you know, any narcotrophic here or anything else. That God, if He were not good, I wouldn't stand a chance. Um, I think of my relationship with my father. <clears throat> I had um, a love of him, and I respected his authority, and I didn't want to displease him. So there was this healthy fear that I wanted to do what was right, so I, um, so I would not disappoint him. And I, in my mind, I kind of think of. Uh, the fear of the Lord in that way is that I want to please Him, and it is that fear because He is so awesome, uh, because He is sovereign, and the authority that He has. Um, Did your father ever hit you? He only spanked me once. Okay. Well, I lied. <laughs> I lied, and I deserved it. <laughs> well, see, you know, my father. We did have verbal punishment, and not always fairly oh. in my house, and so. There was a sense in which, whatever other feeling I had, there was also a fear, a recognition that if I, if I made my father angry, then I could suffer the very real painful consequences of that. Well, that's not an inappropriate thing to think about God. I mean, if we say, if we lie, if we violate his will, if we go against him, we could suffer painful consequences. Now, that's not a fear that paralyzes. It's not a fear that makes us want to run away. It's not that kind of fear. And I, I don't know that I'm doing a great job explaining I mean, I this. I think respectful fear is the way you Exactly. Say it. Yes. You know, yes. Yes. That's what it is. And a recognition that if I, if I get out of line in the wrong way, that I could be punished in a painful way, rightfully so. Yes. You just yes. said you yes. deserved it. I you know, did. I was four. Okay. <laughs> so so the, but it is all those other things. But it is also a sense that we could be, you know, we could suffer pain as punishment. From this guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hebrews talks about God disciplining his children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we walk humbly, God does not desire for us to walk in fear of him and be so afraid that we, we can't even live our lives. He wants to approach us to approach that throne of grace. But if we dis be, decide to walk in pride and, re and rely on our own wisdom and our own, uh, you know, God understands that that will destroy us mm -hmm. and he's going to do whatever necessary to bring us back in line because he is more committed to us being conformed into the image of Christ than what we are. Mm -hmm. And so right. he will do whatever is necessary to bring us back into that. Okay, good. All right, we then get to uh, Job's closing monologue in which he sort of sums everything up. Um, he says in uh, chapter 29, how I long for the months gone by, for the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone on my head and by his light I walked through darkness. The idea that Job had a relationship with God that was always so positive and encouraging and that he relied on God and now he doesn't know what to do with that because God has allowed, now Job thinks God has done this to him because Job has no knowledge or understanding of Satan. Job thinks that God has actively done this to him when in fact we are told, because we get to see behind the curtain, that it is the devil that has done this to Job, but that God gave permission for him. Okay, yes? But I don't think in the end, now I could have been wrong because I might have missed it, that that was ever acknowledged. Uh, because God does not explain himself to Job. God does not give, God in no way defends himself, he does not explain the situation. See, that the... the Everything Job was looking for, God does not give him. He doesn't say, well, let me explain why I did this, or let me explain how this happened, or let me tell you why this occurred. God never says anything like that. He just says, I am God, and you are not, and who are you to question me? All right? Okay. Um, then in chapter 31, Job's closing monologue, he says, If I have walked with falsehood, or my foot has hurried after deceit, 
Let God weigh me in honest scales, and he will know that I am blameless. Job still insists he has not done anything wrong. If my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has been uh, led by my eyes, he talks about not, that he, there's this wonderful statement right before this, Job says, I have a, a covenant with my eyes that I will not look after women lustfully. Okay. Um, if my heart has been led by my eyes, or if my hands have been defiled, then may others eat what I have sown, and may my crops be uprooted. In other words, if I've done any of these awful things that my friends have been accusing me of, then may my punishment be justly received. But I haven't. We then have, uh, from this fairly mysterious character, Elihu. Elihu is standing in the background, apparently. He's not been introduced to us when the other three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, are introduced. And yet he then speaks up and says, you guys really are not, are not doing this right. And Job, you don't get it, have it right. And he says, I'm young, but let me, I, I've been standing here so long, I'm about to bust. I've got to tell you what I think. And so he, he actually has uh, five chapters here that are the speeches of Eliphaz. From uh, chapter 31, so these, this is the start of it. So these three men, again, that's Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. They gave up. But Elihu, son of Barakel the Buzzite, of the family of Ram, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also very angry, he was also angry with the three friends because they had found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him. They couldn't come up with a good refutation, a good response to Job's comments, but they still blamed him. Now Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because they were older than he. Okay, he was a young guy, he was being respectful. But finally, he says, I have got to speak. And he continues through these chapters. Um, and in chapter 35, he says to Job, Do you think this is just? You say, I am right, not God? That Job has been saying, I have done anything wrong. I'm in the right. God is in the wrong. Because God is doing these things to me. And Elihu very, very appropriately says, Really? You think that's the way you ought to talk? And he goes on to say, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed his ways for him or said to him, you have done wrong? So Elihu, this young man, is much more right than the other three friends are. Um, in, in the sense in which he says, you don't have a right to challenge God about this. But he still, and he talks about the fact that perhaps God is doing this in order to perfect you, in order to make you better. Joe, you haven't thought about that. But he still does say, but you know, you still, you've still got to have done something wrong. You're still not nearly as righteous as you claim. And, and the sense is, like nobody is. So Elihu is more correct than the other friends, but he still feels as though, he still is making the assumption that everybody makes, is that if you've been punished this badly, you must have done something wrong. But there may be other factors in here as well. But the part of what he gets very right is, the same thing God says later, and that is, you don't have a right to challenge God on this stuff. He is God, you are not. Okay, so that part, he does get right. And that's the third of the monologues that occur. Immediately after Elihu's speech, we have two speeches from God, and two short responses from Job. But God speaks directly out, it speaks out of the whirlwind, the storm. Uh, Job doesn't have a whole lot to say at that point. When God speaks directly to you, you tend not to have a lot of commentary. So at the start of chapter 38, we have the first statement by God, or first speech from God. Then the Lord God spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? You don't know what you're talking about. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. In this first speech, God goes through and he lays out the creation of the universe. You want to slide ahead uh, Oh, sorry. It's okay. This one. Yeah, I was on the second speech, sorry. Um, all of the creation, were you there? Did you control this? Do you even know how it works? Because if you're going to challenge me, then you have to be capable of that. Or else you don't have a right to challenge me. 
at the uh, in verse uh, chapter 40 it says God finishes by that first speech by saying well the one who contends with the Almighty correct him let him who accuses God answer him then Job answered the Lord I am unworthy how can I reply to you I put my hand over my mouth I spoke once but I have no answer twice but I will say no more Job recognizes, as God laid all this out for him, that, Ooh, what am I doing? Questioning the God that did all of creation. And then God speaks again to him. He starts the same way. Um, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. The same way he started the first speech. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's, and can your voice thunder like his? And he goes on to talk about all of the animals, including the behemoth and the leviathan. It's a great mystery. And people have interpreted that as being the hippopotamus and the crocodile. I don't think so. I think there's more than that. Um, the, the, the two great creatures that man was unable to deal with, and God said, I can do anything that I want with him. I can lift the leviathan out with a hook. You know. Can you do any of this stuff? Do you understand how the animals are cared for, etc., etc.? Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too, work, too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears have heard you. But now my eyes have my ears have heard you, but now my eyes have seen you, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job concedes after God presents who he is as God and says, You really think you have a right to question me about things? Job says, No, I don't. I don't have any right to challenge you. I don't have any right to question you. You are God and I am not. I don't understand it all. But that doesn't mean I have a right to question you about it. And when I say question, I mean challenge. God allows us to ask questions, but respectfully, but he does not allow us to make demands of God or accuse God or demand that God do something different than what he has chosen to do. That's the limit. Yes? I just had an aha moment in that all of Job's righteousness and goodness was because of God. And he's saying that I, I'm, my integrity, I've done this, I've done But Job, I gave it all to you. Yeah. You know, it's from you. It's from me. Uh, exactly. And that doesn't mean just that God had given him all the material possessions yeah. and family. God gave him his very nature yeah. that allowed him to make the right choice. And then you turn around and look at that nature and say, well, I am so good. There must be something wrong with God because now I'm suffering. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lesson. Exactly. Uh, Carolyn and I, um, on a regular basis, we look at each other and we say, you know, God has blessed us so much. Wouldn't it be great if we deserved this? <laughs> or that we had achieved it by our own efforts? Because we haven't. None of the blessing we have is because we did something right or that we deserved it. It is all the grace of God. And that's a recognition of providence. You know, that God's working. Okay? And finally, after all of that, in Job's confession and his repentance of his own presumption before God, God accepts him. God does not accept his friends. <laughs> God says, I am going to judge your friends unless you pray for them, Job. And Job agrees to do so, and he does. And so we end up with the last of uh, the book of Job, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. And I love the fact that the sons don't get any reference, but we hear a lot about the daughters here. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuk. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation, and so Job died an old man and full of years. So, 
God counts Job as righteous because of his, you know, his repentance and his recognition all along. He didn't question God. He didn't call God evil. He didn't, again, he didn't question God in the sense of saying, you know, you don't know what you're doing. Although he did say, help me understand this. God is always willing to have us say to him, help me understand this because I don't. But not to defame him or demean him or accuse him. And so Job had done all of that, but then when God pointed out to him, who are you to question me at all? Job repented in dust, it says. And God then turned on his friends and said he was going to judge them harshly unless Job chose to pray for them. Job did. God sort of let the friends go, and then he blessed Job. Now, one of the challenges that I've heard addressed toward Job is that it makes it sound like um, if you do what God wants, then you're going to have... 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys. That's not what it says. There is no assurance or guarantee to us that if we're obedient to God, He's going to bless us with material possessions. That is the heresy of the prosperity gospel. In fact, the prosperity gospel says that, that if you ask in faith, God is obligated to give it to you. You can order God to give you these things. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Actually, the prosperity gospel people would say that if in faith you ask for a Mercedes and you believe God will give it to you, He has to do it. He doesn't have to do anything. And that is a lie from the pit of hell that has captured a lot of churches in the United States. And unfortunately, in Africa and some other places. The prosperity gospel has really grown in those places. Um, God is under no obligation to bless us materially for any reason. He may choose to do so. He did with Job. But it's not a quid pro quo. It's not a, you know, you do this so God has to do that. In this case, God blessed Job. God could have chosen not to bless Job, and it still would have been within God's control. Right? So we can't ever say, well, God, you did that for Job. I was obedient to you. I was repentant. When am I, when am I going to get my stuff? You know, dialing for dollars is trying to find me. Okay? Um, there is no guarantee of that. And this doesn't tell you that will always happen. All it tells us is that it happened for Job. God chose to do that for Job. Not that he's going to always do it for us. So don't ever make that mistake. Marvin. For 140 years, he's alive. To nail this lesson to anyone who has eyes to see or ears to hear, what happened to Job and what he learned from him? Yep. Right. The testimony of that. John? Well, it says after this, Job lived right. 140 I could interpret that as he lived many more than that because he already had these few sons. And oh, yeah. Sons that, I mean, well, he, he could have been 200 years old. Right. And that's one of the reasons that we believe that this goes back to the patriarchal period because that was when we were told that people lived 150, 180, 200 years, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, you know, we have the Methuselahs who lived over 900 years, etc. cetera. But we, with the idea, this is one of the little sort of markers that says to us, that this was from that time period when people did live longer. Right? Um, they didn't have microwavable pizzas, and you know we don't know exactly why it is that our lives are so much shorter than they are, you know, four score and ten. But um, but they did live longer then. You know, when you go through something like this, I mean, we, my wife, always dreamed of adopting, and I mean, she that was her dream from the time she was a teenager. Me, you know. Not so much, you know, but we, we had six kids, natural, and I needed another kid like a hole in the head. And, you know, but God put it on her heart to adopt again, and I thought, well, we can't afford it, so I can go along with it, and it's no big deal. And so when it finally, God convicted me, and one day it was, it was like he said, you know, if uh, you, Ruth, was standing in the way of something that you dreamed about all your life, how would you feel about her? Kind of kicked me in the rear end. Yep. So I said, okay, I'm, let's go along we'll adopt. She wanted to adopt girls and it was fine. Well, of all the things, I had a dream that we were going to adopt two boys. And I never had a dream that I felt like was from God in my life. And I dreamed this dream. We've got two boys sitting in church and the youngest one in the dream has communicated to me that he is extremely ornery. And lo and behold, we adopt two boys. The youngest one is just the honoriest little part you could ever imagine. And they were held for 15 years. We brought them from Haiti. And, you know, 
we came to Mexico, we went back because we felt like we had to do something with them. And through that time, you know, our marriage almost fell apart. We struggled. And there were so many times when it was so easy to look and say, God, why did you do this to us? You know, what did we deserve? We were just trying to do something good, you know. And uh, finally, we had to come back and say, okay, Lord, you did this. You know, we went along with it. And we just trust you. And we started setting, kind of trying to set them free and put them back in God's hands. And um, the youngest one just gave his heart to the Lord at 18 about two months ago. And he is a total, totally different person now. And if you look at me and say, well, the 15 years worth it, you know, I'm still at that point of saying, you know, it's hard emotionally to say, yes, it was. Still shell shocked is what you're saying. That's right. But mentally, I can say, you know what? It, yeah, it was. Yeah. Because, you know, here's a person that was saved from starvation, from probably certain death, if nothing else, living a life, a, a, a total life destitute. And now he has a, a future with God and. He's desiring to get to go into missions full time. Good. And so, but I look at it and I say, God, we were such awful parents through that period of time. And then I look at it and say, We? Yeah, well, me. <laughs> <laughs> me. Me. You know, because of, you know, our frustration and our, and everything. But I can look at it and say, but Lord, you know what you, you know, you know, it wasn't about me anyway. It was about you. Okay. okay. Any other questions about Job? I think it, I think this could be a whole seven weeks on. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, Job. I mean, there are a number of books of the Bible that we could easily do whole courses on. Roman, Genesis, Rome. I mean, almost any of them, but yeah. especially Genesis, Romans, uh, Job, Revelation. Uh, you know, there there clearly are are books that we could spend a whole time. And if we had four professors, we would. <laughs> <laughs> the poetry was breathtaking. It is. It's beautifully it done. Oh. Yeah. And it's um, a shame we can't read it in Hebrew because then you get some of the uh, some of the structure of the poetry as well. Uh, it, that's an advantage. But um, okay, that's the book of Job. No class next week, and we will be back in two weeks to begin to work on the first half of the book of Psalms.